Welcome to all. I am Dr. Sundar Kumar Subramanian, Assistant Professor in Department of Physiology, All India Institute of Medical Science, Mangalagiri. Today we will be discussing on the topic Physiology of Adrenal Cortex. Suprarenal glands consist of two separate endocrine glands, the inner adrenal medulla, which constitute 20 percentage of the mass of the gland, and the outer adrenal cortex which constitute 80 to 90 percentage of the adrenal mass. These two glands are embryologically different. Adrenal cortex originates from mesodermal tissue while adrenal medulla originates from neuroectodermal tissue. While adrenal cortex secretes steroid hormones, adrenal medulla secretes catecholamines. Hence adrenal medulla is a different type of endocrine organ as compared to adrenal cortex. In this video lecture, we will be concentrating mainly on adrenal cortex. The adrenal cortex again can be divided into three layers. The outer zona glomerulosa, the green color, the middle zona fasciculator, and the inner zona reticularis. The colors are given schematically for better understanding. Each layer in the adrenal cortex has a different function. Zona glomerosa secretes mineral corticoids, particularly aldosterone. Zona fasciculata secretes glucocorticoids, particularly the cortisol. Zona reticularis secretes sex steroids, that is dihydroepiandrosterone. Now let us move into the synthesis of glucocorticoids. All the glucocorticoids or adrenocortical hormones are synthesized from the cholesterol. The cholesterol sources is from mainly the blood or it can be synthesized within the cell. Let's synthesize de novo. The blood forms the major source in all the basal conditions for synthesis of adrenocortical hormones. When under the simulation of ACTH, stored cholesterol and newly synthesized cholesterol will be used for synthesis of adrenocortical hormones. To begin with, the LDL, the low density protein, which contains cholesterol esters are endocytosed into the cytoplasm by specific receptors, the LDL receptors. And after endocytosis, the cholesterol inside the LDL is acted upon by liposomal acid lipase to convert the esters into free cholesterol. The free cholesterol inside the lysosome is transferred to the cytoplasm by the specific protein neman pic the NPC. The free cholesterol in the cytoplasm is carried by specific carrier proteins called star D proteins. Further, the free cholesterol is acted upon by ACAT, that is acyl-CoA cholesterol, acyl transferase. This enzyme converts the free cholesterol to cholesterol esterase, which are stored in the form of fat droplets in the adrenal cortex cells. The free cholesterol can be moved into the mitochondria for the synthesis of adrenal cortical hormones. Here, the movement from outer mitochondrial membrane to inner mitochondrial membrane is done by a specific protein called as steroidogenic acute regulatory protein. This enzyme is required for transport of free cholesterol from outside to inside the mitochondria. The de novo synthesis is mainly from acetate. It goes through various processes and the cholesterol thus formed is again stored in the form of fat droplets inside the cytoplasm. The fat droplets is acted upon by an enzyme called as hormone sensitive lipase which converts the cholesterol esters into free cholesterol which can be utilized for the synthesis of adrenal cortical hormones. The applied aspects. There are various enzymes involved in the transport of cholesterol into the mitochondria. Namely, the liposomal acid lipase is um, represented by the lipogen 
when this gene is mutated the cholesterol stress is not converted into free cholesterol for utilization for the synthesis of adrenal cortical hormones this leads to cholesterol stress storage disease namely the wolfman disease in this condition it leads to adrenal insufficiency the second uh, defect can be in the npc protein this protein as we have seen earlier helps in the transport of free cholesterol from lysosomal to the cytoplasm uh, defect in this uh, protein leads to neiman pick disease the characteristic feature of progressive neurodegeneration and it is very fatal and it uh, death occurs within the first decade the next important protein is the star protein which helps in the transport of cholesterol from outer mitochondrial membrane to inner mitochondrial membrane the mutation in this protein leads to lipoid congenital adrenal hyperplasia the features will be akin to hypoaldosteronism and hypocortisolism because defect in any one of these hormones or the proteins leads to decrease synthesis of adrenal cortical hormones and the clinical features will be similar to that moving on for the synthesis of glucocorticoids the cholesterol thus which has entered into the mitochondria is acted upon by cholesterol desmolase the side chain cleavage enzyme which converts the cholesterol to pregnenolone this is the common step for the synthesis of glucocorticoids or mineralocorticoids or sex steroids in any one of the three layers of adrenal cortex this is considered to be the rate limiting step in the synthesis of glucocorticoids glucocorticoids are mainly under the influence of adrenal corticotropic hormones the adrenal corticotropic hormone acts on the acth receptors which leads to the synthesis of protein kinase a which can act on hormone sensitive lipase which converts the stored cholesterol to free cholesterol further the free cholesterol when it moves into the mitochondria it is converted into pregnenolone by the enzyme cholesterol desmolase the functions of which is again stimulated by acth these are the various steps involved in synthesis of glucocorticoids as we have seen earlier glucocorticoids are produced from zona fasciculata which forms 80% of the adrenal cortex and the important glucocorticoids in humans is cortisol as we can see that this is the structure of the cholesterol and this is the structure of cortisol cholesterol is hydrolyzed at the position 17 21 and 11 beta and dehydrogenated at the position of 3b as you can see in this diagram from cholesterol the side chain is cleavaged due to cholesterol desmolase and it is hydroxylated at three positions 21 17 and 11 and it is hydroxylated at position 21 17 and 11 and dehydrogenated at position 3 so synthesis of glucocorticoids and this is the glucocorticoid synthesis pathway there is one more secondary pathway for the synthesis of cortisol cholesterol is converted to pregnenolone by instead of moving to 17 hydroxy pregnenolone it can be converted directly to progesterone and from progesterone by the action of 17 alpha hydroxylase it can be converted into 17 hydroxy progesterone but this is the less common pathway now coming to the synthesis of mineralocorticoids mineralocorticoids as we have discussed is synthesized from the outer zona glomerulosa layer which constitute the 20 percentage of the adrenal cortex layer the predominant mineralocorticoid secreted in humans is aldosterone in zona glomerulosa the enzyme 17 alpha hydroxylase is defective hence the cholesterol moves in the direction of mineralocorticoid synthesis pathway cholesterol is converted into pregnenolone which is again converted into progesterone by 3 beta hydroxy steroid dehydrogenase progesterone is acted upon by 21 beta hydroxylase to form 
11 deoxycorticosterone which is acted upon by 11 beta hydroxylase to form corticosterone which is acted on by 18 hydroxylase to form 18 hydroxycorticosterone which again acted upon by 18 hydroxy dehydrogenase to form aldosterone. The point to be noted here is that the synthesis of glucocorticoids is mainly under the influence of ACTH, adrenal corticotropic hormone that is released from the pituitary gland. But the synthesis of mineral corticoids is under the influence of angiotensin 2. We will be further discussing about the um, regulation of secretion of aldosterone in the subsequent sections. The main control of synthesis of mineral corticoids is angiotensin 2 and the potassium levels in the plasma followed by ACTH level. Further, the functions of 11 beta hydroxylase, 18 hydroxylase and 18 hydroxy dehydrogenase are all combined together in the enzyme name as aldosterone synthase. So instead of writing these three enzymes separately, in zona glomerulosa, it is practiced to write aldosterone at these levels. This aldosterone has all these activities. As we have seen earlier uh, in glucocorticoids, the cholesterol is hydroxylated at 21, 11 and 18 position and dehydrogenated at 3 and 18 position to form aldosterone. Moving to the synthesis of sex steroids. Moving on to synthesis of sex steroids. They are produced from the innermost layer of the adrenal cortex, the zona reticularis. And the important sex steroid secreted is dehydroepiandrosterone. The cholesterol is converted to pregnenolone, which is acted upon by 17 alpha hydroxylase to form 17 hydroxypregnenolone, which is acted upon by 1720 lyase to form dehydroepiandrosterone. The enzyme 1720 lyase is present only at the level of zona reticularis. Hence, only this layer can form dehydroepiandrosterone. The second uh, less common pathway is that it can take uh, from pregnenolone to progesterone, which is converted into 17 hydroxy progesterone, which is acted upon by 1720 lyase to form androstenedione. So, androstenedione is another sex steroids that is secreted from adrenal glands. The androstenedione is further converted into testosterone and estrogen. So the sex hormones are secreted from human adrenal glands too in addition to the gonads. The point to be noted here is that even though the testosterone and estrogens are secreted from adrenal glands, the amount is very very small to be effective physiologically. Further, the DHEA and androstenedione, which are secreted in substantial amounts are very weak androgens to be physiologically important. But what has to be considered? The DHA is converted in adipose tissue into potent androgens such as testosterone and dihydrotestosterone as well as estrogens, mainly the estrone type. Hence in obese patients, they may have more peripheral conversions and more amount of potent androgens and estrogens circulating in the blood. Hence, the secreted adrenal androgens and estrogens are very less, but the peripheral conversion plays an important role. In case of peripheral conversion to potent androgens, in males it is of very less importance, but in females, the converted androgens plays an important role in axillary and pubic hair growth and it stimulates libido. The peripheral conversion to estrogen in males. The 85 percentage of the estrogen in males is due to the adrenal uh, peripheral conversion and only 15 percentage of estrogen is from the testes. This estrogen in males is very essential for early closure of epiphysis, enhance the secretion of growth hormone at puberty, increase protective HDL levels and in few cases may cause gynecomasia. In case of premenopausal females, 60 percentage of the estrogen is from ovaries, particularly the estradiol type and the 40 percentage is from the peripheral conversion 
the type estrogen in post menopausal female the estrogen contributed by the adrenals substantially increases the steroidogenic steroidogenic enzymes nomenclature the nomenclature which we have used in this class is the trivial names but they belong to cytochrome p450 family of enzymes and they have specific scientific names to summarize the synthesis of adrenal cortical hormones is mainly from the cholesterol it has two sources blood or it can be synthesized de novo or within the cell but cholesterol from the blood forms the main source of uh, cholesterol for synthesis of adrenal cortical hormones adrenal cortex is divided into three layers zona glomerulosa fasciculata and reticularis and each zone produces particular hormone glomerulosa produces aldosterone a monocorticoid fasciculata produces cortisol a glucocorticoid and reticularis produces sex steroids such as dehydroepiandrosterone synthesis of adrenal cortical hormones can follow the monocorticoid synthesis pathway or glucocorticoid synthesis pathway or androgenic synthesis pathway but which pathway it takes is depend upon the presence or absence of particular enzyme in that layer now moving on to the transport and metabolism of glucocorticoids 80% of secreted adrenal steroids bind to transcortin it is a corticosteroid binding protein the remaining 10 to 15% bind to albumin so almost 90 to 95% of cortisol is in binding form only 5 to 10% is in free form but please note here the important point is only the free cortisol plays biological effects or undergoes physiological effects and only the free form is involved in feedback regulation signal to pituitary and hypothalamus the bound form of cortisol only acts as the reservoir let us take an example of pregnancy in which the corticosteroid binding protein level increases and the total cortisol level seems to be increased however the free cortisol level remains same because the free cortisol levels gives feedback information to pituitary and hypothalamus to maintain the level of cortisol in the plasma another important point to be noted here is the half life the half life of cortisol is about 70 minutes while for aldosterone it is only 20 minutes the uh, plasma protein binding helps to increase the half life of the enzymes plasma protein binding protects the enzymes from excretion from metabolism and excretion through the kidney if the enzymes are binded to the protein more then the half life will increase if the binder form is very less then the half life of that enzyme will be less as we can see that the protein binding of aldosterone is less and hence the half life of aldosterone is only 20 minutes as compared to 70 minutes for cortisol the metabolism the cortisol is mainly inactivated in the liver and it is conjugated with glucuronic acid and sulfates to form water soluble metabolites that is easily excreted through kidney so the main site of inactivation of cortisol is liver and it is excreted through kidney in case of liver disease or during surgery or stress the function of liver comes down if the function of liver comes down then the hepatic inactivation of the cortisol decreases and the cortisol level automatically increases this has to be noted in case of liver disease during surgery or any form of stress further the enzymes that takes part in conjugation of the cortisol also conjugates bilirubin other hormones and drugs so there is a possibility of competitive inhibition when the concentration of bilirubin hormones and other drugs inhibit Uh, increases then the availability of the enzyme for conjugating the cortisol may be less that can also increase the plasma levels of cortisol aldosterone is also excreted in urine as a glucuronide conjugate 
The adrenal androgens are also excreted in the urine after conversion to androsterone, eticolanone, and several other metabolites that are collectively called as urinary 17 ketosteroids. In few individuals, there may be episodic bouts of fever because of periodic accumulation of unconjugated eticolanone. This is called as eticolanone fever. Moving to the regulation of secretion of glucocorticoids. The secretion of glucocorticoids or cortisol is mainly under the influence of hypothalamo-pituitary axis. Hypothalamus secretes corticotropin releasing hormone which acts on antipituitary which secretes adrenocorticotropic hormone. This adrenocorticotropic hormone acts on adrenal cortex and facilitates or increases the synthesis of cortisol, aldosterone and DHEA. The hypothalamus in turn is influenced by many other features. Primarily, any form of stress can act on the hypothalamus and increase the secretion of corticotropin releasing hormone. The other influences predominantly are the emotional influence from the limbic system, fear, anxiety that acts through the amygdala have the amyglohypothalamic fibers and influences hypothalamus to increase the secretion of CRH. Pain nociceptive pathways while ascending will give collaterals to the hypothalamus which can also increase the secretion of CRH. The other point to be noted here, the secretion of CRH and thereby the ACTH is under the circadian regulation too. As it will be very clear in this diagram, the x-axis is the time and y-axis is the cortisol secretion. You can see that the cortisol secretion increases at the morning hours at around 8 a.m and then starts to gradually decrease throughout the day. This diurnal variation is due to the hypothalamic circadian cycle. The next regulation is through feedback regulation. The cortisol thus secreted, particularly the unbound form, as I have told earlier, the bound form will not take part in the feedback regulation. The cortisol unbound form will inhibit the secretion of ACTH by acting on the anterior or it can directly act on hypothalamus to decrease the CRH secretion. The short loop feedback, the ACTH can act on the hypothalamus to reduce CRH secretion and the ultra short loop feedback, the CRH secreted from the hypothalamus will act on the cell secreted it and try to reduce the levels of CRH. So there are three levels of feedback regulation to control the secretion of cortisol. Uh, applied aspects. The steroid therapy in patients who are taking steroid therapy for long duration of the sign should not be stopped abruptly. Why? The reason is that when you are giving an exogenous steroid, the steroid inhibits the pituitary production of ACTH and the ACTH level falls down. As the name of the enzyme denotes, adrenal corticotropic hormone. This not only helps in the synthesis of cortisol, but also is essential for maintenance or the tropic action of ACTH on the adrenal cortex. If ACTH level falls down, adrenal cortex will go for atrophy. If in these patients, if you are continuously giving exogenous steroids, their adrenal cortex will be atrophied. If we stop steroid therapy abruptly at this point, the adrenal cortex, which is atrophied, will not be able to secrete enough amount of cortisol at required levels in any form of stress, and the patient may succumb in such a scenario. It would take about 10 minutes for the pituitary adrenal axis to recover. Hence, we have to remember that if a patient is on a long-term steroid therapy, it should not be stopped abruptly. To summarize the regulation of secretion, the regulation of cortisol secretion is under the influence of hypothalamo-pituitary axis. The hypothalamus in turn is influenced by stress, emotion, pain pathways and circadian regulation. And the cortisol secretion is also under the feedback regulation by long loop, short loop and ultra short loops. There are other hormones which can influence the secretion of cortisol, especially the angiotensin 2 antidiuretic hormone 
serotonin and vasoactive intestinal peptide but the physiological actions of this influence on the regulation of glucocorticoids is not yet clear further the long term steroid therapy should not be stopped abruptly because it can lead to adrenal cortex atrophy so it should be tapered and stopped coming to the mechanism of action of glucocorticoids the glucocorticoids especially in humans the cortisol moves inside the cytoplasm and the glucocorticoid receptor is present in the cytoplasm it has cytoplasmic receptor once it binds to the receptor the h of protein which is bound to the receptor is removed and the remaining portion of the receptor moves into the nucleus then it acts on the glucocorticoid response element in the dna which leads to the translation of messenger rna and leads to gene expression the point to be taken is for the glucocorticoid to act the results of the uh, takes few hours to days this is the take home message for the glucocorticoids action to be seen it takes few hours to stay days because it has to go through translation of messenger rna gene expression and the protein formation the mineral corticoid and glucocorticoid activities comparison here you please note only in the first uh, row of this the cortisol thus secreted has both mineral corticoid and glucocorticoid activity why it is very important when the cortisol is secreted in the plasma it can act on both mineral corticoid receptor and causes mineral corticoid features and it act on glucocorticoid receptors to produce glucocorticoid features so the mineral corticoid receptors which are present in kidney colon sweat glands and salivary glands when the cortisol is entering inside such a tissue 11 beta hydroxy steroid dehydrogenase type 2 will inactivate the cortisol into cortisone form hence this will not be able to act on the mineral corticoid receptor the cortisol thus formed when it reaches the tissues which are responsive for the glucocorticoids which have glucocorticoid receptors they have specific enzyme called as 11 beta hydroxy steroid dehydrogenase type 1 which converts the cortisone back to active cortisol now this active cortisol can act on the glucocorticoid receptor for the actions of glucocorticoids the physiological effects of glucocorticoids we have to remember that the main action is on the carbohydrate metabolism the carbohydrate metabolism it increases the glucose levels in plasma this increase in glucose levels is primarily through increase gluconeogenesis that is the glucose is formed newly from proteins and fatty acids the increased gluconeogenesis is mainly through three mechanisms the cortisol causes increased proteolysis in the muscles and the bone to increase amino acids level in the plasma which in turn is utilized to for increased gluconeogenesis it increases the lipolysis and increases the glycerol which is again utilized to for increased gluconeogenesis it also increases the enzyme fructose 16 biphosphatase which is involved in gluconeogenesis by all these mechanisms cortisol will increase the glucose levels in plasma further it also inhibits the uptake of glucose by muscle and adipose tissue this action is called as anti insulin action the glucose uptake through glut4 the glucose transport 4 is insulin dependent the cortisol prevents this insulin dependent uptake of glucose in muscles and adipose tissue by this action too it increases the glucose levels in plasma so what is the use of increased glucose levels it is very very essential in starvation in case of starvation the amount of glucose levels in the plasma goes down and the presence of cortisol is essential to maintain this glucose levels so that the vital organs such as brain and heart continues to perform in the absence of the cortisol or in the patients with adrenal insufficiency 
they should not fast or they cannot um, withstand starvation because the protective effect of cortisol of the brain and the heart by increasing the glucose is not in them hence the adrenal deficient patient should not fast protein metabolism the action on protein metabolism is by increasing the proteolysis and decreasing the protein synthesis it has mainly the anti anabolic effect the main action is through for increasing the gluconeogenesis and increasing the glucose levels in the plasma the fat metabolism it increases lipolysis and decrease lipogenesis this is through action on increasing the hormone sensitive lipase it also helps in the action of catecholamines and glucagon catecholamines and glucagon also causes lipolysis but their action on lipolysis is supported by the presence of glucocorticoids this action of glucocorticoids is called as permissive action the lipolysis will increase glycerol as we have seen earlier that will be used for increased gluconeogenesis it also increases free fatty acids which is also is important for the energy supply for the vital organs such as brain and heart resistance to stress physiologically any change in environment that changes or threatens to change any existing optimal steady state is called as stress stress increases acds secretion and it is essential for survival this acds secretion will lead to the secretion of cortisol which plays an important role in survival of the subject this we can see in hypophysectomized or adrenalinized animal they die when they expose to the similar level of stress the reason why glucocorticoid is essential in stress is still unclear though there are two proposed mechanisms the permissive action of cortisol to increase vascular reactivity to the catecholamines secreted by the sympathetic nervous system that is activated simultaneously when there is a stress there will be two limbs activated the sympathetic nervous system which is very fast is also activated at the level of the hypothalamus the hypothalamus pituitary adrenal axis which is slightly a slower limb of the response will lead to the secretion of cortisol both the limbs are activated simultaneously to overcome the physiological response for the stress to maintain the emergency energy supply that is the free fatty acids the permissive action of cortisol is required for catecholamines to exert their lipolytic activity the catecholamines that is secreted to stress will have lipolytic activity for catecholamines to have the optimal level of lipolysis a small amount of glucocorticoids is essential hence these two mechanisms of cortisol is considered essential for the animals to survive a stressful condition the stress increases cortisol to high pharmacological levels that in short term are life saving to understand this better let us have an example the stress during interdigestive period that is a state of fasting or starvation because this is a stress the cortisol levels are increased and there is increased level of catecholamines from sympathoadrenal output since it is a fasting state insulin glucagon ratio is less this leads to action on the liver increased glycogenolysis glycogen is broken down to form more glucose increased gluconeogenesis new glucoses are formed from proteins amino acids and lipolysis As in skeletal muscle there is increased proteolysis protein is broken down there is decreased protein synthesis and decreased glucose transporter for mediated glucose uptake in case of adipose tissue again the lipolysis is increased lipogenesis is decreased and there is decreased glucose for mediated glucose uptake the final end result is that these responses ensure sufficient energy to meet increased demand on body and will maintain adequate blood glucose levels necessary for conscious and deliberate action in other words this glucose and free fatty acids that are produced under this stress is essential for the proper functioning of the brain and heart 
This is further supported by the sympathoadrenal output, but also by cortisol, which optimizes the adrenergic receptor function. The catecholamines also helps in lipolysis, and again, as we have discussed earlier, the cortisol, through its permissive action, is essential for proper lipolysis caused by catecholamines. Cortisol will also contribute to providing energy for the incipient inflammatory and immune response to this stress, but will also protect the individual from potential damage of unregulated inflammation. This protection from inflammation we will be seeing in the subsequent section. Hence, we have to remember that in a case of stress, particularly during interdigestive period, the main role of corticosteroids is to provide sufficient energy for the vital organs for proper functioning of the brain and heart. Let us take a, a different position. The chronically elevated levels of cortisol, in other ways, a well-fed person. This type of scenario is seen in Cushing's disease. Here, the cortisol level is raised, but we have to note that since it is a well-fed person, there is increase in insulin glucagon ratio and there is a decrease in catecholamines because it is not a stress and simply the adrenal output is less. Here, the response is slightly different. The cortisol, chronically elevated levels of cortisol acts on the CNS to increase appetite. So the subjects will be taking food more. This may be due to neuropeptide Y hormone secretion. The action on liver is different. It increases hepatic glycogen synthesis. Action on skeletal muscle is more or less the same. It increases proteolysis and the glucose, four mediated glucose uptake is inhibited. In adipose tissue, there is increased lipolysis. What you have to note here, there is increased triglyceride synthesis also. The lipogenesis is also increased in contrast to the previous scenario. Here, um, pre-adipocyte to adipocyte differentiation is also increased. And again, the glucose, four mediated glucose uptake is reduced. Uh, this is not decreased, this is increased. There will be increased differentiation from pre adipose to adiposite. As we can see here, that there are slight differences in the response of the chronically elevated levels of cortisol from the elevated levels of cortisol to acute stress. We can see both lipolysis and lipogenesis, both are increased. This leads to redistribution of fat, the abnormal redistribution of fat as seen, a localized obesity, the abdominal neck and face, with muscle wasting and weakness, especially at the extremities. This is a typical scenario seen in chronically elevated levels of cortisol. Both cortisol and insulin promote differentiation of pre-adipocyte to adipocyte site. We have to further note that it is a well-fed state and there is increase in insulin glucagon ratio 2. We can see that cortisol also increases the glucose levels in the plasma. In a well-fed well state, when already the glucose levels are increased, if the cortisol also is going to increase the glucose levels, it leads to glucose intolerance and it can lead to steroid diabetes. So comparison of these two scenarios will help us better in understanding the function of cortisol under acute stress and under chronically elevated levels of cortisol in pathological state. Moving on to the next function, physiological function, it maintains the vascular reactivity. It is a permissive action of the catecholamines. We can see the importance of this in case of adrenal insufficiency. In adrenal insufficiency, the blood vessels become unresponsive to calamines, catecholamines and they become dilate and they may even collapse. Let us take an example of hypovolemic shock. In this scenario, catecholamines are injected because they can cause vasoconstriction and increase the cardiac output, thereby maintain blood pressure. Injecting a cortisol in this scenario will help in increasing the responsiveness of blood vessels to the injected catecholamines and thereby ensure adequate vasoconstriction and thereby able to maintain blood pressure. This is the importance of the permissive action of cortisol on the vascular blood vessels. So even in physiological condition, 
the blood vessels has to react to catecholamines a small amount of cortisol is required what is permissive action small amounts of glucocorticoids must be present for a number of metabolic reactions to occur although the glucocorticoid by themselves do not produce such reactions in other words as we have seen just now glucocorticoids will not be able to produce vasoconstriction by themselves but they will facilitate the vasoconstriction caused by catecholamine such an action is called as permissive action glucocorticoids presence is required for glucagon and catecholamine to exert their calerogenic action for the catecholamines to exert their lipolytic effect for the catecholamines to produce proper bronchodilation and vasoconstriction these are the few permissive actions by the cortisol what is the effect of cortisol on blood cells it stimulates hemopoiesis so it increases circulating red blood cells it increases platelets and it increases neutrophils increasing neutrophils is because of excess release from the bone marrow reduced morgenation and reduced diapedesis into the tissues on the other hand the cortisol decreases the levels of eosinophils it decreases the level of basophils and it decreases lymphocyte count it also has an important role to play in water metabolism cortisol increases renal blood flow and glomerular filtration rate it helps in rapid clearance of water load in other words it increases the free water clearance this can be better understood with an example let us take an example of glucose solution infusion when a glucose solution is infused glucose is metabolized and utilized by the body while the water that is remains has to be excreted through the kidney this will not be a problem in a normal individual but if the patient or the subject is adrenal insufficient when this water is not be easily removed through the kidney this will be a retain and it will cause water intoxication the plasma level becomes hypoosmolar due to hemodilution because the water is retained and the plasma becomes hemodiluted this decrease in osmolality causes the brain cells to swell particularly the hypothalamic thermoregulatory mechanisms are impaired this causes fever this glucose is known this fever is known as glucose fever this can even lead to collapse and death hence we have to understand that normal physiological levels of cortisol is essential to maintain the plasma osmolality by the rapid clearance of water load on central nervous system you can see again by the example of adrenal insufficiency it leads to mild personality changes in terms of irritability apprehension and inability to concentrate so normal cortisol levels is essential for the normal functioning of the central nervous system moving on to the pathological effects of cortisol we have already seen this the increase in plasma glucose levels by gluconeogenesis and by inhibiting the glucose uptake in muscles and adipose tissue this action of cortisol is essential in starvation for the proper fuel supply to brain and heart but if it happens in abnormally excessive chronic levels of cortisol then it can lead to steroid induced diabetes further if the patient is already having a diabetes and the cortisol levels are chronically increased it can further complicate the diabetes by increasing the keto acid production protein metabolism as we have seen earlier the normal physiological function during the stress is to produce uh, amino acids by proteolysis to provide for gluconeogenesis but chronically abnormal levels will lead to anti anabolic effect will lead to decrease muscle mass and strength this will lead to weakening for the subject fat metabolism we have already seen that in acute stress it increases lipolysis to produce to give energy for the vital organs but if it is abnormally increased it will also increase lipogenesis both lipolysis and lipogenesis increases and it will lead to increasing total body fat and the fat is redistributed 
abnormally leading to centripetal obesity moon phase and buffalo hump it action on the gastrointestinal tract it increases gastric acid secretion and decreases protective gastric mucosal cell proliferation both this action will lead to peptic ulcer as we can see that stress normally increases cortisol if the cortisol levels are maintained for longer duration of time it can lead to ulcer such type of ulcers is called as stress ulcers on bone it inhibits bone formation it decreases the synthesis of type 1 collagen it inhibits the conversion of osteoprogenitor cells to osteoblast osteoblast or the bone forming cells it decreases calcium absorption from the gat hence the calcium necessary for bone formation is also less it also facilitates bone resorption all this action leads to decrease in bone mass and mineralization leading to osteoporosis hence it is advisable for all the patients who is under long term steroid therapy to undergo bone x ray or mri to find out the bone health especially in the elderly who are susceptible for osteoporosis on connective tissue it inhibits collagen synthesis this is reflected in terms of decrease skin thickness and causes thinning of capillary walls now the capillaries become very fragile and they will be ruptured easily it can even lead to intracutaneous hemorrhage so these are the features of abnormally chronically elevated levels of cortisol now the pharmacology pharmacological effects of cortisol it actions on immunity it is an anti immunity hormone causes involution of lymph nodes thymus and spleen by inhibiting the lymphocytic mitotic activity it decreases the release of cytokine interleukin 2 by inhibiting nf kappa b which reduces the proliferation and leads to apoptosis of these cells the high doses of cortisol suppresses both humoral and cell mediated immunity this um, action of cortisol is utilized in preventing transplant rejection anti allergy the base of philopenia as we have seen earlier the action of cortisol on the blood cells it reduces base of cells this property is used in allergic response it reduces allergic response due to decrease in histamine release the next important action of cortisol is anti inflammatory action it stabilizes lysosomal membrane hence it inhibits the release of proteolytic enzymes that are essential for inflammation it decreases capillary permeability and thereby inhibits the diapedesis by leukocytes leukocytes by diapedesis move from the plasma into the tissues and initiates the inflammation so that step is prevented by cortisol it decreases the release of inflammatory mediators such as serotonin histamine and hydrolysis from granulocytes mast cells and macrophages it also inhibits prostaglandin synthesis many of the prostaglandins are involved in inflammation hence by these mechanisms cortisol inhibits inflammation and this property of cortisol is utilized in many inflammatory diseases such as rheumatoid arthritis and asthma the point to be noted here this for this pharmacological effects to take place the level of cortisol is above the physiological levels so above the physiological levels it is given as formal pharmacological dose to bring about these anti inflammatory anti immunity and anti allergic actions to summarize cortisol can drastically reduce the toxic features of acute inflammatory conditions such as pneumonia or active tuberculosis however we have to note that only the inflammation is reduced but not the infection so it is essential to give antibiotics at the same time we have to remember that a symptom is the warning sign of the disease and masking it by steroids can delay the diagnosis and prognosis hence while using a steroid for inflammatory condition for infection we have to be very careful that we are giving antibiotics at the same time to summarize the actions of cortisol 
we have to divide the actions into physiological actions, chronic excess actions and the pharmacological actions. Physiological actions, it increases plasma glucose levels, it increases proteolysis and lipolysis for helping gluconeogenesis, it increases hematopoiesis, increases RBC platelets and neutrophils while it decreases eosinophil, basophil and nephocyte. Helps in clearing the water load. It maintains vascular reactivity to catecholamines and it is essential for normal CNS activity. Chronic excess levels of cortisols is diabetogenic, ketogenic, muscle wasting, fat redistribution leads to gastric ulcer, osteoporosis, easy vessel fragility and there will be connective tissue loss. At pharmacological doses, it can be used for anti-inflammatory and anti-immunity and anti-allergic scenarios. Now, coming to mineralocorticoids. As we have seen that mineralocorticoids are produced from the outer zone of glomerulosa which forms the 20% of adrenal cortex and the main mineralocorticoid in humans is aldosterone. But we have to note down that the intermediate products such as corticosterone and 11 deoxycorticosterone also has some mineralocorticoid activity. The next important point that we have considered earlier is that the regulation of mineralocorticoid synthesis is mainly through angiotensin II as compared to glucocorticoids which regulation is mainly through ACTH. Coming to the mineralocorticoid and glucocorticoid activities, we can see here that aldosterone mineralocorticoid activity is 3000, while corticosterone and deoxycorticosterone also has some form of mineralocorticoid activity. The regulation of mineralocorticoid secretion is mainly by hyperkalemia, which is a potent stimulus for aldosterone secretion, followed by angiotensin II, which is physiologically important stimulus and ACTH. ACTH is not important physiologically, we will see why now. Hyperkalemia mediated stimulation is the basis for renal regulation of body potassium balance. We have to note on that body potassium balance is maintained predominantly by the aldosterone regulation. Angiotensin II mediated stimulation is important for correction of hypovolemia or hypotension. Hence, the ECF volume is maintained through angiotensin-mediated stimulation of aldosterone. ACTH-mediated stimulation is not important physiologically and its influence on the aldosterone is for diurnal variation and the secretion of aldosterone during stress. Why ACTH is not considered important physiologically? Let us say, uh, see a condition in which ACTH is stimulated uh, stimulating the secretion of aldosterone continuously. What happens? The resultant hypokalemia and inhibition of angiotensin II oppose any change in the levels of aldosterone and bring it back to normal. Hence, in physiological levels, ACTH is not considered important to control aldosterone. You will be able to better understand this while we see the physiological actions of aldosterone. Let us take an example of glucocorticoid remediable aldosteronism. In this condition, ACTH influence on aldosterone is more potent than potassium or angiotensin II. What happens? This leads to condition like hyperaldosteronism. Because aldosteronism, there is no feedback regulation of aldosterone to pituitary or hypothalamus. In this condition, cortisol has to be administered, which will give a feedback inhibition to pituitary and hypothalamus. Hence, it is called as glucocorticoid remediable aldosteronism. ACTH regulation. We have seen this diagram earlier. Hypothalamus secretes CRH, antipatriary secretes ACTH, and the adrenal cortex secretes cortisol. And cortisol will give a feedback inhibition to the above endocrine glands for regulation. But the aldosterone which is secreted does not have any feedback uh, to the anterior pituitary or hypothalamus. If there is excess ACTH mediated aldosterone secretion, it has to be controlled through externally admitting a 
administering a cortisol which can reduce the level of ACTH. That is the basis for treatment of glucocorticoid remediable aldosteronism. Now coming to the physiological axiom so aldosterone. The aldosterone mainly acts at the collecting duct tubule present in the <coughs> nephron. The aldosterone acts on the mineralocorticoid receptors which is present inside the cytoplasm. Please compare it to the glucocorticoid receptors. There also the glucocorticoid receptors were present in the cytoplasm by adding to the glucocorticoids then the glucocorticoid receptors will move to the DNA and act on glucocorticoid response elements to form translation of messenger RNA to cause gene expression. The similar mechanism of action is involved in aldosterone. Aldosterone enters inside the cell to attach with mineralocorticoid receptor which is present inside the cytoplasm. It will lead to gene expression. ROMK gene, SGK1 gene and ENAC gene. ENAC in epithelial sodium channel gene which helps in the expression or the formation of the sodium channels. The sodium channels thus formed is sodium channel thus formed is put in the epithelium which helps in the absorption of sodium from the lumen site into the cell. The second SGK1 gene expression produces SGK protein which helps in the movement of sodium channels from the cytoplasm to the epithelium. It also inhibits the degradation of the sodium channels. So it has two functions moving the formed sodium channels to the epithelium and preventing the sodium channel in the epithelium to get degraded. The next is the ROMK gene which is the potassium channel which helps in the movement of potassium channels to the epithelium. This potassium channel helps in the movement of potassium from inside the cell to the lumen. So what is the net effect? The net effect of aldosterone action is sodium uh, net sodium reabsorption net potassium excretion since the sodium is reabsorbed water is reabsorbed passively this effect will affect the ecf volume and sodium is reabsorbed water is passively reabsorbed and this can increase the ecf volume when there is a net sodium reabsorption we have to note down here that there will be a net potassium loss To understand the role of aldosterone in ACF volume maintenance, let us look at this flow diagram. Let us start at the point of decreased extracellular fluid volume. This leads to decrease in renal arterial main pressure. This decrease in main pressure will act on juxtaglomerular apparatus to secrete renin. Renin helps in the conversion of angiotensinogen to angiotensin 1 which in turn is converted into angiotensin 2 by the enzyme angiotensin converting enzyme. Angiotensin 2 acts on adrenal cortex to secrete aldosterone. As we have seen in the earlier slide, aldosterone helps in the reabsorption of sodium and thereby water at the level of cortical collecting duct in the nephron. This helps in increasing the extracellular fluid volume thereby negating the original stimulus. So the physiological action of aldosterone, it plays a major role in potassium homeostasis. It is of secondary importance in regulation of fluid and electrolyte balance, despite its direct action on sodium and water reabsorption. Aldosterone escape phenomenon, what do you mean by that? If there is increased aldosterone by any means, this increased reabsorption of sodium and water, this leads to ECF expansion, which in turn increases the venous return. Venous return will distend the atria and the heart. The distension of atria will result in secretion of atrial natriuric peptide from the atrial myocytes. This natriuric peptide causes natriuresis, that is secretion of sodium in the urine and causes diuresis. This will return the ECF volume to the normal. Hence, increase in aldosterone alone cannot increase the ECM volume by itself. There is an aldosterone escape phenomenon. It also increases 
reabsorption of sodium from sweat and digestive juices too. Let us come to the applied aspects in this chapter. Enzyme deficiency. We are talking about the enzymes which are involved in the synthesis of adrenal cortical hormones. Let us review the regulation of cortisol secretion. Hypothalamus secretes CRH which acts on anterior pituitary which releases adrenal corticotropic hormone which acts on adrenal cortex to release cortisol. Cortisol in turn has feedback inhibition on both anterior pituitary and hypothalamus. Let us have a condition in which cortisol is decreased. Then the feedback to the anterior pituitary and hypothalamus is also reduced. What will happen in this scenario? The secretion of CRH will increase. The secretion of ACTH will increase. Since ACTH is a tropic hormone, the adrenal gland will increase in size. This is called as congenital adrenal hyperplasia. So the excessive production. So how to look at the clinical features of such enzyme deficiency syndromes? When an enzyme is deficient, the clinical features will be related to the deficiency of the enzyme uh, of the products below the enzyme and the excessive production of the substrates which are above the enzymes. In case of adrenal cortical hormone synthesis and enzyme deficiencies in this uh, flow, there will be increased production of sex hormones which leads to genital abnormalities. Hence, such enzyme deficiency syndromes are called as adrenogenital syndrome. The most common one is 21 beta hydroxylase deficiency. This is the flowchart for the synthesis of adrenal cortical hormones. If the 21 beta hydroxylase is deficient, as we can see from this flowchart, neither cortisol nor aldosterone is produced. Hence, the entire cholesterol is diverted to the production of sex steroids. So the clinical features will be the glucocorticoid low, mineralocorticoid low, salt losing. Aldosterone is involved in reabsorption of sodium and helps in maintenance of ACF volume. Since there is no aldosterone, it leads to hypovolemia and hypotension. Since the entire cholesterol is diverted to synthesis of sex steroids, it will result in high virilizing effect. In females, it can even lead to pseudohermaphroditism. Let us look at the clinical features of such deficiency. In adenogenital syndrome in females results in hirsutism, small breaths, male pattern of hair distribution in pubic region, enlarged clitoris and receding hairline as seen in male. In severe cases, genitalia of female are masculinized. Such a condition is called as pseudohermaphroditism. There is also decreased aldosterone decreased mineral corticoid. This results in decreased salt and water retention and this leads to hypovolemia and hypotension. Coming to the next common deficiency, 11 beta hydroxylase deficiency. Decrease in or deficit in this hydroxylase. The important point to be noted here is there is no cortisol, hence the glucocorticoid effect that is low. But in this condition, 11 deoxycorticosterone is produced in excess. As we have seen in the earlier slides, 11 deoxycorticosterone also possesses some form of mineralocorticoid effect. Hence, in this condition, there will be excess production of deoxycorticosterone, which leads to high mineralocorticoid activity, which will result in hypertension. Again, the more amount of cholesterol is diverted to sex steroid synthesis and there will be virilization in this deficiency too. So as we have seen, deoxycorticosterone has 3% activity of aldosterone. Hypersecretion leads to excess mineralocorticoid activity leading to salt and water retention and thereby hypertension and hypokalemia. We have to recall the functions of aldosterone. Aldosterone act at the level of cortical collecting duct in the nephron. It leads to net reabsorption of sodium along with net excretion of potassium. Hence, excess mineral corticoid activity will lead to hypokalemia too. Excess DHA has virilizing effects as mentioned earlier. In both cases, treatment is by glucocorticoid therapy. 
exogenous glucocorticoid suppress ACTS secretion and thereby reduce deleterious effects. So in both 21 beta hydroxylase and 11 beta hydroxylase deficiency, the treatment is glucocorticoid therapy. In 17 alpha hydroxylase deficiency, by looking at this diagram, you can see that 17 alpha hydroxylase moves the cholesterol from mineralocorticoid pathway to glucocorticoid and androgenic synthesis pathway. The absence of 11 alpha hydroxylase results in the only production of aldosterone, both cortisol and sex steroids are missing in this condition. This type of deficiency happens at the level of gonads too. So even gonads will not secrete proper sex hormones. The predominant features will be that of aldosterone excess, so salt and water retention, so hypertension and hypokalemia that is expected. Corticosterone has mild glucocorticoid activity. So symptoms of glucocorticoid deficiency is less in this condition. The point here is that decreased sex hormones in females leads to sexual infantilism in females. Decreased sex hormone in males leads to feminization and pseudo hermaphroditism in males. So male pseudo hermaphroditism is seen in 7 alpha hydroxylase deficiency while Female pseudohermaphroditism is seen in 21 beta hydroxylase deficiency. Moving on to the next. Now moving from enzyme deficiency to adrenal insufficiency. The primary example is Addison disease. It is a primary adrenal insufficiency. Why it is called as primary? The disease process that destroys the adrenal cortex at the level of adrenal cortex itself. Hence, this adrenal insufficiency is called as primary adrenal insufficiency. The common cause in the history is due to tuberculosis, but now it has moved from tuberculosis to autoimmune inflammation. Now, what are the various features of adrenal deficiency? We can divide that into three categories due to deficiency of mineral corticoid. As we have seen that what is the main function of mineral corticoid? That is our aldosterone. Aldosterone helps in reabsorption of sodium and thereby water and increases ECF volume which maintains the blood pressure. If there is a deficiency of aldosterone, it will lead to chronically hypotensive subjects. They will have very small heart because decreased work due to hypotension. They may have Addisonian crisis, severe hypotension and shock. This is not only due to mineral cortical deficiency, but it's also due to glucocorticoid deficiency. We have to again remember the permissive action of glucocorticoid for the catecholamines due to deficiency of glucocorticoid. As we have seen that glucocorticoid is very essential to maintain glucose levels at the time of fasting. In case of adrenal insufficiency, the patient should not fast. If they go for fasting, it will cause fatal hypoglycemia because the vital organs such as brain and heart will not have enough fuels to proceed with the work. Any type of stress can cause collapse. Water is retained and there is a danger of water intoxication. As we have reviewed in the physiological actions of cortisol, cortisol is essential for normal removal of water load. In the case of adrenal insufficiency, water is retained and water intoxication happens. So these are the features of adrenal insufficiency. The other feature is the circulating ACTH levels are high the absence of feedback inhibition. As we have seen in the regulation of cortisol secretion, the cortisol gives feedback inhibition to antirepetitory and hypothalamus to reduce the ACTH levels. Since in adrenal insufficiency, cortisol levels are less, there is no feedback inhibition and the circulating levels of ACTH rises drastically. The point here is that the ACTH has melanocyte stimulating hormone action. This melanocyte stimulating hormone causes diffuse tanning of the skin and spotty pigmentation. It also causes pigmentation of skin creases and gums. So pigmentation is very common in case of adrenal insufficiency. There are minor menstrual abnormalities in women and deficiency of adrenal sex hormones has little effect. As we have seen that the adrenal androgens, even the adrenal testosterone and estrogen the secreted amount is very, very less to pay, play in physiological role. The only importance of adrenal androgens is from its peripheral 
conversion. Adrenal insufficiency, secondary adrenal insufficiency if the defect is at the level of pituitary. Tertiary adrenal insufficiency if it is the defect is at the level of hypothalamus. What is the difference between secondary and tertiary from the primary? These two types are mild because the mineral corticoid effects are less. Why mineral corticoid effects are less? As we have to see the difference in regulation of cortisol secretion and aldosterone secretion. Cortisol secretion is mainly under the influence of ACTH, which is under the influence of pituitary and hypothalamus. But mineral corticoid regulation is mainly under angiotensin 2. Hence, in case of secondary and tertiary adrenal insufficiency, mineral corticoid effects are less. Only glucocorticoid will be affected. Further, there will be no skin pigmentation because ACTH levels are low. Because of defect in pituitary and hypothalamus, the secretion of ACTH is low and thereby the cortisol levels are low. So ACTH which causes swing pigmentation is not seen in secondary and tertiary adrenal insufficiency. Now coming to Cushing syndrome, as you have seen that this is one example of chronically elevated level of cortisol. This is a clinical picture as produced by prolonged increases in plasma glucocorticoids as explained by Harvey Cushing. Again, this can be divided into ACTH independent. That is, um, excess production of cortisol is from adrenal tumors, hyperplasia, exogenous administration like therapy or ACTH dependent that it can be produced from anterior pituitary tumor or ectopic ACTH secreting tumor such as from lungs. So what are the various features of Cushing syndrome. It leads to protein depletion because there is excessive protein catabolism. Skin and subcutaneous tissue becomes thin and muscles poorly develop. Wounds heal poorly. There is minor injuries caused by bruises. Hair thin and scraggly. Body fat is redistributed. Extremities are thin. Fat in the abdominal wall. Face and upper back leading to buffalo hump. We have to recall that what are the pathological effects of higher levels of cortisol. We have seen that higher levels of cortisol in carbohydrate metabolism can lead to steroid induced diabetes. Excess action on the protein metabolism will cause muscle wasting. Excess action on fat metabolism leads to redistribution of the fat. Further, thin skin stretched by increased subcutaneous fat deposition. So it leads to subdermal tissue rupture to form prominent reddish purple striae in the bodies. It causes insulin resistant diabetes mellitus, hyperlipidemia and ketosis. It causes significant mineral corticoid activity, salt and water retention. As we have seen in the earlier table, the cortisol has equal potency for acting on both mineral corticoid and glucocorticoid activity. Along with facial obesity, it can lead to moon phase. It leads to potassium depletion and weakness and hypertensive. What is this potassium depletion and weakness? This potassium depletion and weakness is because of the mineral corticoid activity. Mineral corticoid activity, sodium reabsorption and potassium excretion. Potassium is essential for normal functioning of the muscles. Hence, hypokalemia causes weakness. Increased sodium and water retention leads to hypertension. It also causes osteoporosis. It can lead to collapse of vertebral bodies and fractures. Mental aberrations are very severe. It leads to increased appetite, insomnia, and inforia to the level of psychosis. We have seen that the normal physiological levels of cortisol is essential for normal functioning of CNS. In case of adrenal insufficiency, there may be a mild CNS defect, irritability, and lack of concentration. But in case of Cushing syndrome, the action on the CNS is severe. The increased facial hair and acne due to increased sex steroids as seen in Cushing syndrome. So these are the common clinical features as found in this disease. The next is hyperaldosteronism. What is primary hyperaldosteronism? As seen, we have seen them, when we will call it as primary, when the disease is at the level of adrenals, as in case of adrenal adenoma, namely the Kahn syndrome, adrenal hyperplasia and adrenal carcinoma. What are the various features? It leads to hypertension due to sodium retention and ECF expansion, muscle weakness and fatigue due to hypokalemia, and polyuria 
due to hypokalemic nephropathy there will be no edema because of aldosterone escape phenomenon and the polyuria as mentioned in the third point so in primary hyperaldosteronism it leads to hypertension muscle weakness polyuria without edema the secondary hypo hyperaldosteronism is associated with edema because the primary stimulus itself is movement of sodium and water out of circulation into the interstitial fluid that results in hypovolemia the hypovolemia is now the stimulus for secretion of aldosterone the aldosterone secretors is unable to correct the hypovolemia because whatever the sodium and water that is retained will again go back into the tissues that will aggravate the edema rather than correcting the hypovolemia hypokalemia is not prominent because hypovolemia reduces urinary flow rate so amount of potassium loss is also less so in secondary hyperaldosteronism hypokalemia is not so prominent and it is associated with edema while primary hyperaldosteronism hypokalemia is severe and there is no edema we have seen this earlier cortisol has equal potency for acting on both mineralocorticoid and glucocorticoid receptors but the tissues such as kidney colon sweat glands and salivary glands escape from the mineralocorticoid activity of the cortisol because they possess an important hormone 11 beta hydroxy steroid dehydrogenase type 2 which converts the active cortisol to inactive one this inactive cortisols move to the structures which are responsive to the glucocorticoids such as liver skin brain adipose and placenta they have one more enzyme called as 11 beta hydroxy steroid dehydrogenase type 1 which will convert the inactive form to active form so that it can act on the glucocorticoid receptors there is a clinical condition called as apparent mineralocorticoid excess here there is a deficiency of 11 beta hsd type 2 as we can see in this earlier diagram if this is defective then the cortisol is not converted into inactive form it is free to act on the mineralocorticoid receptor so the cortisol will now have mineralocorticoid activity freely so hence this condition is called as apparent mineralocorticoid excess so we have reviewed the various uh, applied aspects to summarize adrenal cortex plays an important role in resisting stress it has three layers zona glomerulosa zona fasciculata and zona reticularis and each layer has separate function zona glomerulosa secretes aldosterone which has main action on potassium uh, balance and it also plays a important role in ecf volume maintenance zona fasciculata secretes cortisol which plays an important role in maintaining the fuel supply to the vital organs such as brain and heart during stressful conditions for resisting the stress the zona reticularis secretes sex steroids and the sex steroids are not so essential for the normal physiological functions its physiological importance is based on its peripheral conversion thank you